All right, it's time to answer some questions. I want to thank everybody who submitted questions. Um, it, I should have said something about the thing of replying and things. Uh, I saw a lot of you have been replying to questions and things like that. I'm not going to read your replies. Uh, the, you know, the whole purpose of this video is for people to ask questions to me. Um, I thank my brothers and sisters in Christ out there for doing some back and forth trying to answer people's questions. Praise the Lord, that's great. But um, you know, I'm not going to read the replies for sake of time. Uh, but we're going to start out here um, with one claiming me to be a false preacher again. You can see it here. Uh, TF says, false teachers and false prophets will have the hottest place in hell. I agree, but I'm not a false prophet or a false teacher. Those preaching a false gospel will experience far worse torment than the worst, worst pedophile serial killer. Beware, Denlinger, take heed. You preach another gospel, a lordship salvation gospel of hard believism. What's your proof for that? None. When have I ever said anything about lordship salvation? I've condemned lordship, sal lordship salvation. Lordship salvation is Calvinism. It's what John MacArthur teaches. Okay, of doing a whole bunch of good works and proving that you've, you know, that you are meriting your salvation and cleaning up your whole life, and God later gives you, He grants you repentance, and then you get saved later on. I've never taught that. Okay, you're a liar. TF, you are a liar, whatever your real name is, I don't know. Um, we are saved by faith and blood and accepting Jesus Christ as our personal Savior. Exactly what I've preached for years and years and years. I've never preached that uh, you don't have to have faith in Jesus Christ and that you can earn salvation through your own good works. I've never preached that. Who's inspiring you to lie like this about me? We are not saved by repenting of our sins. I never said you were turning over a new leaf or living a changed life. Never said you were. Those are proofs of salvation. That's what happens after you get saved. All right, after salvation. Did you hear that? Did you hear that? You might want to clean the wax out of your ears or you know the cobwebs out of your brain and hear me again. All right, you do works after salvation. I'll show you that here in a minute. Those are works, and, st and grace stops being grace when you add works to it. I'm warning you, Denlinger. I hope you change your mind and get saved before it's too late. Okay, here we go. Ready? I'm going to get saved. I believe that Jesus died for my sins and that he is my personal Savior and that his death on the cross is enough to pay for my sins. I said that in sincerity and truth. Okay, I'm saved now, right? Oh, that's right. I have to stop preaching what I preach. Who's really teaching a faith and works if it's just belief then I'm saved but how would I convince you there TF how would I convince you that I'm genuinely saved perhaps by me saying I have a profession of faith and yet living in sin and not rebuking sin then I'd be a saved Christian according to you I think you're the one that needs to be concerned about salvation you know, there's a lot of people that uh, claim to be saved, and yet it doesn't take. You look at the fruits that they're, you know, of their profession, of their life, and it just doesn't, it doesn't line up. I should say that the fruit of their life doesn't line up with their profession. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Absolutely, I've preached that verse over and over and over again. But look at verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Why is it that you easy believism heretics seem to leave that one out? Good works follow salvation. It's incredible. And of course, you're, you know, this is supposed to be questions for me. And yet you're condemning me. But let me read you a little testimony of a saved man, okay? Just read you a couple little quotes here. Uh, it says here, Hence today I believe that I am acting in accordance with the will of the Almighty Creator. Uh, I am fighting for the work of the Lord. He believes in Jesus. Of course he believes in Jesus. This man that wrote that quote, he believes in Jesus. He says here, by the living God. Another quote there by the, by the living God. He says, I fell down on my knees and thanked heaven from an overflowing heart for granting me the good fortune of being permitted to live at this time. He prays to God. He believed in Jesus. He went to church. 
See, who was it? Hitler. Professing Christian. Obama's a professing, professing Christian. He believes in Jesus. All these sodomite churches out there, churches, they believe in Jesus. They put salvation messages on their, on their uh, websites and things like this. But they're saved, and I'm lost because I say salvation, and you're supposed to have a changed life after salvation. You're supposed to clean up those sins. You're supposed to come to God as a sinner, repenting of your self-righteousness and saying, I'm a wicked sinner. I can't save myself. That's why I put my faith in Jesus Christ and you help me, Lord, to change my life after salvation. The Lord rebuke you, TF. I don't even know who you are, but you're, you're off. All right, let's go on to the next question. We have uh, Final Redemption says, What do you think about the cherub's description in Ezekiel 1, Ezekiel 10, and Revelation 4, and how Peter Ruckman associated those descriptions? Revelation commentary, Peter Ruckman showing the devil exactly as Baphomet Freemasonry. Thanks for this channel. It is really a blessing. Okay, uh, good question. Uh, this is one where I would disagree with Peter Ruckman. All right, turn to Revelation chapter 4, verses 7 and 8. All right. Um, you read the verses there, it says, And the first beast was like a lion, and the second beast like a calf, and the third beast had a face as a man, and the fourth beast was like a flying eagle. And the four beasts had each of them six wings about him, and they were full of eyes within, and they rest not day and night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, which was and is and is to come. All right, notice there that the beginning part of, part of verse 8, it says that they had six wings. Six wings. All right, go back, keep your hand there in Revelation chapter 4. Go back to Ezekiel chapter 1. Uh, you can read verses 5 down through 11. We're not going to for sake of time, but uh, verse 6. And everyone had four faces and everyone had four wings, not six. Okay, Ezekiel chapter 10. They're not identified there what they are, cherubim or seraphim, in chapter 1. But if you go to chapter 10, it says here um, about, uh, well, it begins in verse 1. Then I looked, and behold, in the firmament that was above the head of the cherubims, there appeared over them, as it were, a sapphire stone, as the appearance of the likeness of a throne. And it goes down through there, cherub, cherubim, 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 going down through. Um, see where it says about Okay, verse 21. Ezekiel chapter 10, verse 21 says, Everyone had four faces apiece, and everyone had, or and everyone four wings. And the likeness of the hands of a man was under their wings. So you see it there that um, Ezekiel chapter 1, these beings are said to have four wings. In Ezekiel chapter 10, they have four wings, and they're called cherubim. Now, the creatures that are back there in, in uh, Revelation chapter 4, they have six wings. You say, well, maybe it's just, you know, they got confused or something. No, not quite. Um, let me see, where's my reference at here? Isaiah chapter 6. Turn back to Isaiah chapter 6. And we're going to see here that these are um, seraphim. Isaiah chapter 6, verse 2. And it stood, or excuse me, above it stood the seraphims. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. So seraphim have six wings. Cherubim have four wings. Now, Isaiah 6, 2 says six wings. Revelation chapter 4, if you turn back there with your other hand, Revelation 4, verse 8 says the four beasts had each of them six wings. So, um, you know, Obviously, I've learned a lot from Dr. Ruckman, and you can learn a lot from him and everything else, but no man's perfect, all right? And I would disagree by calling the, you know, seraphim, they're clearly seraphim in Revelation chapter 4, uh, calling them cherubim. They weren't, they weren't cherubim, they were seraphim. Not a huge, big thing. I would depart company from him or anything like that or call him a heretic, whatever. But uh, they're seraphim there. And as far as the thing of him... Um, Showing the devil exactly as Baphomet 
Freemasonry, if you haven't, if you don't know what that is, you can look that up, Baphomet. Um, yes, I do believe that Satan, if you go to Ezekiel chapter 28, it talks about, you know, thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. Um, Satan was a cherubim. He was not a seraphim. Um, and so, yes, I do believe that Baphomet is a, is a pretty accurate description, a pretty accurate drawing of what Satan would actually look like. I believe that uh, as a cherubim, he would have had four wings. But uh, I disagree with the thing of Revelation chapter 4. They were seraphim. Okay? Next question. Paul Layton. In the 1,000 year reign of Christ, I think you spelled reign wrong there, brother. If we got a thousand years of rain, it's going to be pretty wet. But uh, I understand R E I G N, you know, is what it should have been. But in the thousand year reign of Christ on earth, do all the saints come back with him, or is it conditional on our works after being saved? Well, 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. Verse 11 says, It is a faithful saying, for if we, if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. If we deny him, he also will deny us. What's the denying there? You say, well, you lose your salvation. No, keep reading. Verse 13, If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. So you're not going to lose your salvation, but you are being denied something. All right? And what is that? Uh, go back to Galatians chapter 5. You can begin in verse 19, but we're going to go down to verse 21. You look at all these different lusts of the flesh. Uh, verse 21 says, Envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Now the kingdom of God is two different things in your King James Bible. Um, first of all, it is a physical, or excuse me, spiritual fellowship between you and the Lord. That's there. But it's also a reference to the millennial kingdom. The Bible, you know, at one point the Lord talked about, uh, you know, that the Jews would see people coming and sitting down in the kingdom of God with Abraham and Isaac and things like that, but they themselves would be thrust out. So the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven are, can refer to the physical reign of Jesus Christ on the earth. But the kingdom of heaven can never be that spiritual fellowship between us and the Lord. The kingdom of heaven is in the book of Matthew. Again, you've got to compare Scripture with Scripture. Um, Joey Faust has come out with this thing about the, the rod, will God spare it, or something like this. And basically, he has the carnal Christians in hell for the millennial kingdom, um, and the good ones on earth ruling and reigning with Christ. Well, I don't see any Scripture for that. I think that's absurd that, uh, you know, Jesus Christ paid for our sins. Why would the body of Christ, part of the body of Christ, have to be in hell burning for a thousand years? Uh, I think that that's rather stupid. Um, I would say simply that when you don't inherit the kingdom of God um, because you're messing around with the lust of the flesh, let's just say somebody's truly saved, but they're just, you know, really sinning, living in sin. Um, well, if, if they're not suffering as a Christian, you know, 2 Timothy chapter 2 says they're not going to rule and reign with him. You know, he will deny us. He'll deny that person um, millennial inheritance. Um, what will they be doing at that time? I don't know. Uh, there's theories on that. You know, I, I think the thing of burning in hell is, is absurd. But some people say, well, maybe they'll be up in heaven. Um, you know, they aren't going to be come back down with the Lord and stuff. Again, where's that at in Scripture? I mean... Marriage Supper of the Lamb, Revelation chapter 19, uh, does it say that only some of them get married and some, you know, stay there and they aren't really part of the bride and stuff, get into the Baptist brider thing there again? There's a lot of heresies and stuff. Um, I just stay away from stuff that's not real crystal clear. You know, I mean, I have my opinions and things. Uh, personally, I would say probably that, that a Christian that does a rather carnal job um, probably is, you know, I don't see... A division of the body of Christ in Revelation 19, we all come back, you know, with the Lord. And uh, there's the marriage supper of the Lamb. Uh, I don't think that there's bad Christians up in heaven up there sulking, going, oh, I wish I could have been invited, you know. No, I think everybody goes back down. But, you know, maybe the carnal, lukewarm Christians that are genuinely saved, not false converts, maybe they'll be cleaning toilets or something for a thousand years. I don't know. Cleaning stalls or something like that. 
horse stalls. I don't know. Um, but uh, in the thousand year reign of Christ on earth, do all the saints come back with him or is it conditional on our works after being saved? Uh, Revelation 19 would be where I would go on that. I don't see anywhere where it says some saints are left in heaven, some come back. You know, it's all of them come back. There's no division there. So I would say, yes, Christians come back, but the um, level of honor that you will have at that time is dependent upon your suffering for the Lord right now in this life. That's how I would answer that question. Uh, trust, trust in God says, Who of the apostles physically fight back against attacks to them or their family by persecutors or thieves? Which of them carried a weapon for its use? Did Jesus told told them to fight back. Did Stephen or Paul or Philip fight back in violence when they were jumped in violence? Okay, um, I'm kind of getting the idea there. Um, was there ever a sense in which they were fighting or things like this? Well, you know, the verse I'd take you to is Luke chapter 22. Uh, let's see. Verse 36 says here, then, he, then said he unto them, But now he that hath a purse, let him take it, and likewise his scrip. And he that hath, hath no sword, let him sell his garment and buy one. And Jesus is not speaking spiritually or figuratively or anything else. Uh, he's speaking physically. And, of course, you have after this, you know, the, the, they come to take Jesus in the garden, and Peter draws his sword and whacks the guy's ear off. And the Lord's like, put up your sword. He doesn't say, hey, why did you buy a sword? What are you doing with that sword? He says, put it up. He didn't say, hey, hand your sword into the soldier. No, he put it up. Don't use it right now. All right. Um, I mean, where in, the, where in the Bible does it say how many times a day Paul had to go to the bathroom? Or uh, what exactly were the meals that they ate? Uh, what was the typical diet of the apostles? It doesn't. Um, there are some things that the Bible does not record. Um, getting into physical fights and altercations, I do believe that, that uh, saved people will be kept from violence. You know, I'll show you that, actually, too. Um, you know, and of course, you know, they, you know, Paul was executed, as well as most of the other disciples. Um, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm, I'm not talking about, you know, a bunch of papists getting together and conspiring against you and, you know, having you thrown into prison and eventually tortured to death or executed. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about you're down, walking down the street and some guy comes out to rob you, molest you, whatever else, and you fight him off. Well, that was not recorded. And it's not, and you say, well, then we shouldn't do it. Well, it's not recorded that you, you shouldn't fight either. But uh, Proverbs chapter 1, verse 33 says, But whoso hearkeneth unto me shall dwell safely and shall be quiet from fear of evil. Um, I think we'll be shocked when we get to eternity to see how many times the Lord protected us. Um, now, if you're in a country where you can have weapons, if you're here in America, I think you should have weapons. I think you should be armed. Um, part of the reasoning for that is simply because an armed people, an armed society is a polite society. When you get countries that are disarmed, um, there's a lot, a lot higher degree of, of violence. Now, the Lord can protect a Christian in a country like that, but a people as a whole, when they are armed, it's just a common sense thing. A murderers are going to have a harder time in a country uh, where everybody's armed. So you're actually reducing crime as a whole people. You know, But if you're in a country where everybody's disarmed, well, the criminal element really isn't afraid of anything, you know. So it's, to me, it's just a common sense thing, you know. Um, I mean, where does the Bible say that we should eat uh, whole foods and raw foods and things like that? Well, it's common sense, you know. There's a lot about the Bible that's just common sense, you know. Certainly there's nowhere we're saying that we should convert people by the edge of the sword or something. Certainly not that. Um, you know, and, uh, you know, as far as the thing about the, Jesus told them to fight, you know, when did Jesus tell them to fight back or whatever? Well, we're going to be doing some, some rather interesting things in the 
at the end of the time of Jacob's trouble going into the, the uh, millennial kingdom. There's some interesting stuff there. I've done studies on that, so I won't get into it here. But anyhow, let's continue. Next one, Romans chapter 10, verse 17. Brian, in Isaiah 14, 12, is this talking about when Lucifer fell in the Garden of Eden or a reference to when he gets cast out of heaven in the book of Revelation? Thank you. Well, let's go there. Isaiah chapter 14. If you don't have a King James Bible, you're going to have a hard time on this one. Because uh, your Bible, if you use anything but a King James Bible, your Bible doesn't say Lucifer. It's actually a reference to Jesus Christ falling from heaven, the bright morning star. You know, think about that. Isaiah 14, verse 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds, I will be like the Most High. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell to the sides of the pit. They that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee, and consider thee, saying, Is this the man that made the earth to tremble, and did that did shake kingdoms, that made the world as a wilderness, and destroyed the cities thereof, that opened not the house of his prisoners. You know, so, and it goes on and on and on there. But the point is, um, in the book of Isaiah, you're going to see this thing many, many times where something is said that is a reference to a past event, and then it transitions into what's going to happen in the future. So what we have here in Isaiah 14, 12 is you have the fall of Lucifer that happened in the past. But his eventual judgment and destruction, and I believe it's at the Great White Throne judgment there, when you get up to uh, verse 15 and 16, that's coming yet in the future. So um, to answer your question, I do believe that the fall of Lucifer was not in the pre-flood world or something of the gap theory. I don't believe in that. I believe it was in the Garden of Eden, you know, when he messed with, with Eve and things and he deceived her, you know, I believe that that is when the Lord officially kicked him out of heaven at that point. So, you know, and, you know, as far as the thing of being cast out of heaven in the book of Revelation, you're talking about Revelation chapter 12, um, you know, that is another part of it that, that's in the future. And, you know, you, you read there in um, verse 17 of Isaiah 14, that made the world as a wilderness and destroyed the cities thereof that opened not the house of his prisoners. That right there, I believe, is a reference to what happens when he comes down in Revelation chapter 12. You know, woe to the inhabitants of the earth. You know, let's, let's actually turn there. Keep your hand in Isaiah 14. We'll go to Revelation 12. Good question. Uh, Revelation chapter 12. Um, verse 9. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil, and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Jump down to verse 12. Therefore rejoice ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil is come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. So you see, compare that with um, verse 17 of Isaiah 14. That made the, the world as a wilderness and destroyed the cities thereof. All right, right now, the kingdoms are given to the devil and he's building them up. But when he gets cast down to the earth, there in Isaiah or Revelation 12, he's going to destroy the cities. He's going to have great wrath at that point. So you're dealing with his initial fall from heaven, which I believe was in the Garden of Eden when he deceived Eve. That's when he was cursed. But then when he gets kicked out of heaven is there, verse uh, 17. But then he's eventually going to be brought down into hell. You know, so it's, it's, it's a whole lot of prophecies there of the life of Satan given in a couple verses there in Isaiah 14. So... Hope that answers your question. The Lord has an interesting way sometimes of writing and you know doing things in His Word. Um, okay, next we have Transit Rider One. I saw this apparent conflict between accounts of Paul's conversion in one of David Daniel's vlogs posted in the comments by someone named 
truth seeker. <laughs> you gotta love that. You get these people all the time. You know, I'm a truth seeker, and they just hate the Bible and hate the Lord. It's like, mm -hmm. but anyways, they say I looked at both verses, Acts nine seven and Acts twenty two verse nine, um, and I can't figure it out. Other than the fact that some just heard the voice of Jesus and others just saw the light, I became curious about the difference. I don't believe the Bible contradicts itself as truth seeker believes in his posted comment. Am I missing something here? How do you explain the difference? Well, let's look at it. Acts chapter 9, verse 7, in one hand. Actually, 20, and chapter 22, verse 9, in the other. Okay, there's that. All right, Acts chapter 9, verse 7. And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice but seeing no man. All right, 22, verse 9. Oh. And they that were with me saw indeed the light and were afraid, but they heard not the voice of him that spake to me. So you have 9 verse um, 7. And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. And over here in 22 verse 9, they that were with me saw indeed the light and were afraid, but they heard not the voice of him that spake to me. Well, again, is Paul referring to everybody? there is he referring to some people that were you know because sometimes back there in the past they would have had you know you have like caravans and stuff of people they would join other people would be traveling hey we're going to damascus too and they they join a caravan for safety they would travel in numbers so paul could be referring to two totally different groups of people all right he could be saying the men that were with me uh see here in uh, verse nine chapter nine the men which journeyed with him you know, the Lord recording this here. The men was journeying with him, meaning Paul, stood speechless, hearing a voice but seeing no man. 22, verse 9. They that were with me saw indeed the light and were afraid, but they heard not the voice of him that spake to me. I don't know. You know, there's the whole thing. I mean, um, I look at it and I simply say, you know, Paul could be referring, you know, it is saying the people that were with him, but, you know, he could be for referring to two different groups that were with him. That's how I explain it. You know, again, um, you know, I would look into who this truth seeker person is. Um, are they an atheist? Because atheists, uh, you know, they're not really atheists. They're more like God haters, um, unrepentant sinners that that uh, don't like being judged for their sins, is what they are. And they'll look for anything that they can find in the Bible, any quote-unquote contradiction so that they can weasel out of the coming judgment. And, you know, to look at that and say, that's going to make my decision whether or not to accept or reject Jesus Christ is kind of absurd. I mean, it's like, uh, you know, there's all these Muslims attacking and killing people over in Germany and, and around the world. There was one in France today and things, uh, Normandy. And, uh, and, you know, I read two different articles and they have some of their details different. Well, I said, well, then I just reject the whole story. I don't believe it happened. No, no, you know, I'd have to ask the person involved. I'd have to ask the Apostle Paul, well, what do you mean? This guy heard the, the sound, this one didn't. And he'd probably say, oh, yeah, well, I, what I was explaining is whatever. But people come up with this these lousy attacks on the Bible and um, it's really kind of absurd. And, and again, you know, oh, well, we found a contradiction in the in the Bible, so we we must reject the whole Bible. Okay, what are you, what are you left with then? If the Bible's not true, if God really doesn't exist, then everything came about as a random chance, a random accident, at some undetermined time in the past. I mean, when you stop believing in God, you've entered the realm of kooky insanity. All right, so it takes a lot more than this kind of a thing to shake my faith. You know, <laughs> I'm not saying you're faith is being shaken brother I'm just saying you know you know I would just look at it and simply say it's Paul talking about two different groups of people within that group that he was traveling with okay that's how I'd answer that next we have Pedro Paidson hello I have a question is the prince of princes in Daniel 825 Satan 1611 has a lowercase p. Also in Daniel 11:36 and 37, it talks about exalting 
himself above every god and the god of his fathers. I've asked this question before and respect people for their answers. Just wanted your take on it. Okay. Um, Daniel chapter 8. Daniel 8 verse 25. Um, Through his policy also he shall cause craft to prosper in his hand, and he shall magnify himself in his heart, and by peace shall destroy many. And he shall also stand up against the prince of princes, but he shall be broken without hand. Um, and then Daniel eleven thirty six through 37. Uh, and the king shall do according to his will, and he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god, and shall speak marvelous things against the god of gods, and shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished, for that is determined shall be done. Neither shall he regard the god of his fathers, nor the desire of women, nor regard any god, for he shall magnify himself above all. Um, I don't have a original copy of the 1611 Old Testament. I have a photographic copy of the New Testament, but um, you know I'd have to check into that whether or not they were capitalized or lowercase or whatever else. Um, but you know I would simply say that yes, I do believe in the context there that uh, Prince of Princes. Is the Prince of Princes in Daniel 8.25 Satan? I would say no. I believe that the Prince of Princes there in verse 25 would be Jesus Christ. You know, King of Kings. You know, I mean, because he, he shall also stand up against the Prince of Princes. You know, is the Antichrist going to stand up against Satan? No, he's Satan manifest in the flesh. So why would he stand up against his master Satan? No, I believe it's a reference to Jesus Christ. Okay? Um, and as far as the God of... Uh, God of gods and the God of his fathers, uh, you know, I would say that there, you know, there's the thing there of, um, you know, the Antichrist is going to have some connection to the Jewish people. Whether or not he's going to be Gentile or whatever, I don't know. You know, there's different questions I have there. But uh, if he is Jewish, at least partly Jewish, the God of his fathers, you know, would be you know, the Lord God, the God of the Bible. So, um, again, I can't, I can't prove one way or another on the 1611 thing. And, and again, you know, watch out for this thing of these little uh, Zondervan type um, reprints of the 1611 King James Bible. A lot of times they're changing stuff and, and messing up things and whatever else. And keep in mind also that the font that was used, the Gothic font in 1611, to print the 1611 King James, um, there's some of the letters are different than the Roman font that is used today, you know. And it's not doesn't mean it's a Catholic font or something either. There, it's just a name that they use for the thing. Um, so, I'd have to check into it. But you know, I do do believe that the Antichrist there is standing against the Prince of Princes, meaning Jesus Christ, and that he re does not regard God, the God of the Bible. Um, so I saw you have two other things there, but I just kind of said, okay, one question without getting into a whole bunch of other stuff. So we'll continue on. Joseph Dunn, I really wish you would do another Bible study review, or study Bible review, excuse me. I would love to hear you do a review on the Dake Annotated Reference Bible, please. Well, uh, different people have sent me study Bibles and said, you know, could you please review this? Well, for me to review it, I have to read a lot of it. So... Um, I have a few things to do. You know, um, will I ever get around to doing that? I don't know. You know, to me, it's, it's, I've done some of that in the past, and um, I wasn't married. I was definitely not a father. Didn't have my own place. I mean, there are a lot of other responsibilities that come along with my current life. And uh, I could dedicate a little bit more time. Um, but now, of course, I, I have another you know, it's not that it's all oh, it's really bad now that I'm married because my wife actually helps me with some of the research. So, you know, when we, as I've said in another video, uh, update video, the last one I did, um, we're reorganizing, restructuring things here and um, moving stuff around, you know, to be more efficient. So will that happen in the future? Maybe. There's a couple different study Bibles that I would like to do reviews of, so that might be a possibility for the future. Um, if anybody, I'll just put this out there, if anybody wants to take some time and 
do the review. Um, get a uh, Dake annotated reference Bible. If somebody wants to go through some of the footnotes and, and see some things and whatever else, send me a list of problems that it has. That would be a great help to me. If the uh, Lord puts that in your heart to, to find some questionable doctrines in it, that would be a great help. You know, and I can, I'll say, hey, I think if you want your name mentioned, I'll mention your name. If you want to remain anonymous, that's fine. You know, that's up to you. That would be a great help to me. Um, certainly, I would appreciate it. But uh, we'll continue here. Um, Cody 02, seven-year tribulation or three-and-a-half tribulation? Neither. I don't believe in the word the tribulation for that time period. I know what you're saying, brother, there. I, I understand that uh, there's a lot of debate back and forth. Um, this this teaching of when the Antichrist shows up, is it going to be, you know, this time of Jacob's trouble, this, this Daniel's 70th week, is it going to be the full seven years or is it just going to be kind of peaceful for the first three and a half or is it going to be some other deal for the first three and a half and then the last three and a half is is when that's the actual I hate to use the term great tribulation or you know it's not really a biblical title it's a description but never a biblical title for that time period um, but I would just simply go to uh, Um, Daniel chapter 9 verse 24 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy um, and it goes down there you know 7 weeks verse 25 Three score and two weeks, the street shall be built again, and the wall, even in troublous times, and after three score and two weeks. So you see this thing of the week is likened to, you know, seven, the number seven. And I think that the number seven has a very important biblical connotation. And uh, so to say, well, the first three and a half years is kind of um, not really part of the tribulation using that term problems. I call it Daniel's 70th week. And the week, I believe, is a period of seven years. And in the midst of that week, there's going to be, uh, you know, a whole lot happening in that, at that three and a half year period. And that's when it's going to get really bad after that. But to say that the first part is somehow not the tribulation. I know there's another popular teaching which is coming out now. I've been hearing it. And it might have been taught for a while, but it's only recently that I've been hearing it. And that is they're trying to say that the first part of this this first three and a half years is all just natural disasters and that part is the tribulation and then after that is when God's judgments come. I don't agree with that. Um, read Revelation chapter 6. You know, it's Jesus that's opening the seals. Okay, uh, it's not that the Lord's up there just watching things happening and oh wow, it's natural disasters are bad. The disasters and the war and everything else that comes, the famine, the death, you know, all that, um, it's the Lord's judgment. Okay, it's the wrath of God coming upon a world that has rejected His Son. So, um, you know, and again, you know, I would caution against this thing of Christians really getting into debating, well, what exactly is going to happen in that time period and what, it, what are the fine details and stuff. We're not going to be going through that time period. So I just kind of say, you know, I understand what the Bible says and I just kind of go with that. And to, to get in there and kind of dissect everything, I just don't, uh, I don't spend much time on that. I know what I'm supposed to do, in other words. Uh, Jack Pressler, how many raptures are there in the time of Jacob's trouble? Todged there. After the church is raptured, I've heard like three and two. Thanks. Okay. Well, I'll show you where people get that from. Uh, let's start out here. Yeah, I gotta think of where that passage is. Um, Revelation chapter seven. We'll start there. Uh, verse three, saying, "Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads." Then you have the hundred forty-four thousand being sealed. Down to verse eight. 
Verse 9, After this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations, and kindreds, and people, and tongues, stood before the throne, and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands, and cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, which sitteth upon the throne, and unto the Lamb. And all the angels stood round about the throne, and about the elders, and four beasts, and fell before the throne on their faces, um, and worshipped God. And it goes on there. Um, Verse 13, it says, And one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes, and whence came they? Where they come from, in other words. Verse 14, And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said unto me, or he said to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation, and have washed their robes, and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Now this is not at, after the second coming. This is during the time of Jacob's trouble. So these people are up there. When did they go up? It's a good question. Now, uh, let's see here. I've got to think of where this next one is. Okay, chapter 14, Revelation chapter 14, uh, verse 14. says, And I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and upon the cloud one sat like unto the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him that sat on the cloud, Thrust in thy sickle, and reap, for the time has come for thee to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. And he that sat on the cloud thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. And another angel came out of the temple which is in heaven, he also having a sharp sickle. And another angel came out from the altar which had power over fire, and cried with a loud cry to him that had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in thy sharp sickle, and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. And the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth, and gathered the vine of the earth, and cast it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. So you have the first harvest there, they're gathered. But it doesn't say that they were destroyed. The second one, they're gathered, it's grapes being gathered and put into the great winepress of the wrath, wrath of God. So what was the first harvest about? See? See? Uh, Revelation is not chronological. Okay, It tells a story over and over and over again, sometimes with more or less detail. That's important to understand that. So there's some kind of a gathering in that time of Jacob's trouble. There's some kind of a thing there. Right? I mean, it's, it's just there. Verse, uh, chapter 15, um, verse 2. And I saw, as it were, a sea of glass mingled with fire, and them that had gotten the victory over the beast, and over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name, stand on the sea of glass, having the harps of God. Okay? Again, another group that's in heaven. Is this a description of the same ones that were back in Revelation chapter 7 or whatever? I mean, it's, it's a very detailed book. You know, uh, I think there might even be an upcoming question. Somebody says, could you do a study of the book of Revelation? Well, um, honestly, that's not one of my stronger points. I understand the thing about the, the rapture. You know, I try to master it you know, the Pauline epistles, because that's what's given to me as a, you know, Christian preacher in this time period here, this um, church age, if you want to call it that, okay? Uh, that's that's my job, so that's where I try to figure things out, and I think that there's a lot going on in the book of Revelation that's just simply not going to be revealed to us as Christians living in this church age time period. Um, we can look at some things and figure some stuff out, but honestly, you know, life is going to change after the rapture and all these plagues being poured out, poured out and everything. I mean, it's, it's going to be a bad time. So can I really comment perfectly on that time period? No, I can't really. Uh, will there be some raptures in that time period? Well, it definitely looks that way. Can I be dogmatic about the number and how many and whatever else? No, not really. And, you know, we're not going to go there for sake of time, but you can even look in the Gospels and it talks about one taking the other left and two women grinding at the mill, one taking the other left, you know. And um, people say, well, see, that's the rapture. No, no, that's not the rapture. Because you read over and uh, you see here quick, I'm going to make sure I get the reference right. Um... Luke chapter 17. Um, 
Verse 34 says, I tell you, in that night there shall be two men in one bed. The one shall be taken and the other shall be left. By the way, let me just stop there because I've seen this people go, that's the Mandela effect. God's word never said two men in one bed. That's sodomy. Uh, no, that's the result of you being a pervert in your mind and having your mind corrupted by watching television too much. Um, two men have slept in one bed. There's many poor countries where they still do that. Okay, here in America, uh, back before people had a lot of money, um, you'd have farmers and loggers and whatever else, and they would oftentimes sleep two men in one bed. Why? They didn't have money for everybody to have their own bedroom and bathroom and whatever else. I mean, poor people will sleep a few people in one bed. That doesn't mean that there's sodomy going on and they're a bunch of perverts. It's only the people that read it and think that way that have had their mind perverted. But let's continue here. Verse 35, two women shall be grinding together, the one shall be taken and the other left. Two men shall be in the field, the one shall be taken in the other left. So people have used this to, to say about the rapture. It's not the rapture. How do you know? Keep reading. Verse 37, And they answered and said unto him, Where, Lord, where are they taken, in other words? And he said unto them, Wheresoever the body is, thither will the eagles be gathered together. It's a reference to Revelation chapter 19 when Jesus Christ comes back down. So when they're taken they are taken in the sense of they're leaving that area, they're taken out, they're fleeing, getting out into the mountains, and the Antichrist army is coming out to pursue them, and Jesus Christ and the saints come down and destroy the Antichrist and his army before they wipe out the saved Jews at the end of the thing. That's what's going on there. So to use the gospel accounts of one taken the other left to prove one of these raptures that's coming at the end, I don't agree with that. Um, there are apparently some raptures, there are some catching up of people in the time of Jacob's trouble. Uh, you read about that in, back in Revelation 7 and 14 and 15, but I don't believe that that's the same thing that's going on here in the Gospels. That's my answer to that one. Next we have 9095 Steve. Do you believe that the book of Genesis, or excuse me, the book of Giants and the book of Enoch can be used as a reliable source? No. Please let me know what you know about these books and how they can be used with Scripture. They can't be. Uh, the Book of Enoch is very, very kooky. It's, it's weird. And you say, but it's mentioned in the Bible. I get that. You know, I have a FAQ on this because I've been asked it many times. What about the Book of Enoch? Well, I'll show you here uh, where people will turn you to say that it's part of Scripture. Okay, Jude chapter 1. There's only one chapter. Verse 14, And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied of these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousands of his saints. So people say, well, see, Enoch said things, so he wrote things, so there must be a book of Enoch. Uh, no, it was a bunch of Gnostics that, that uh, saw this, and they capitalized on the idea that Enoch is speaking, he's writing, so we'll write this book called the Book of Enoch, and we'll say that it's actually from Enoch. Oh, okay, where, where's this at in the Old Testament? Where's anybody quoting from the Old or from the Book of Enoch in the Old Testament? Where is there any story of somebody? I mean, Enoch died before the flood. So, uh, did Noah take his, this Book of Enoch on the ark with him, and then it was passed down carefully till you can get it at the secular bookstore today? No. And the Book of Enoch has some really, really weird stuff in it. It's not scripture. So, um, no, the Book of Enoch is, and the Book of the Giants. I'm not even sure what that is. I think it's a football team, the Giants there, but uh, don't mess with the Book of Enoch or the Apocryphal books and things like that. King James Bible is what you need. All right, Carl Cockwell. Who was God talking to in Genesis when he said, let us make man in our image? Okay, well, I would say that uh, he was talking to Jesus Christ. All right, and you say, well, Jesus Christ didn't exist yet. Well, Jesus Christ was there eternally as the Son of God. Now, see, you know, I saw a lot of questions coming up here, different people asking things about how this all works. Well, great is the mystery of godliness. We can't understand how God can be Father and Son at the same time and Holy Ghost also, and, and Jesus as the Son can pray to God the Father, and it's a mystery. I mean, I'm glad that I don't worship a God that I can understand. If I can understand God and explain God, then he's not a very great God. Because he would be, if I can understand him with my level of intellect, then he's not really all-powerful. Um, 
you'll see in the Old Testament the angel of the Lord is oftentimes a reference to the Lord. Uh, there's there's other manifestations of the Lord. I'll show you a good one. Um, Here's another one that uh, the new versions will change. Daniel, Daniel chapter 3, verse 25. Uh, he answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose, walking in the midst of the fire. Nebuchadnezzar is thrown Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego into the burning fiery furnace. And they have no hurt. And the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. So Jesus Christ appears in a pre-incarnate form, and he's walking around in the fire with these you know, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, if you know the story. Um, so the Lord is able to do all kinds of things like that. You know, He's able to appear before He comes down and is born of Mary. You know, God is not limited to the same rules that He puts upon us. All right, He's able to do far more than we can understand. So yes, He would have been talking to Jesus there. God the Father talking to Jesus. And you say... Oh, well, that doesn't make much sense. Well, again, you read over in Revelation chapter 5, and, you know, Jesus appears as the Lamb of God, and he goes up to the one sitting on the throne, and he takes the book out of his hands. How does that work? Well, you know, explain to me eternity. What's it like to live outside of time? Well, we can't really... We, okay, explain to me God. Well, we can't. You see? You know, the Bible says the just shall live by faith. And that's what we have to do. I'll be talking more about this stuff as we continue on. But uh, no friend like Jesus says, Hello, Brian. Hi. Does the implementation of the mark of the beast start at the beginning of Daniel's 70th week or halfway through it? Reading Revelation chapter 13, it appears that the mark is first enforced by the second beast who shows up after the first beast has been slain and revived from a head wound Revelation 13, 3 through 5 seems to show that his head wound happens halfway through as he continues for three and a half more years afterwards. Okay. Well, let's turn there. Um, uh, let's see here. Where do we want to start at? Uh, verse 11. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he, had, and he spake as a dragon. And he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him, and causeth the earth and them that which dwell therein to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. Um, and then you jump down to verse, um, verse 16. And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Um, here's wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 603 score and 6. All right. Uh, so the question is, if this guy shows up after the three and a half year mark, well, then what do you do for the first three and a half years there? Is the mark of the beast not implemented until he dies and comes back to life? Well, um, I would say that... Um, verse chapter 13 verses 1 through 5 is describing sort of the Antichrist's life. That doesn't mean that you know the false prophet has to wait until the end of all that stuff and then show up. I believe that the false prophet is going to show up shortly after the Antichrist does. I don't believe that he has to wait for three and a half years till the Antichrist dies and is resurrected. I believe he's going to show up shortly after. Okay? Um, you know, I mean, that's, that's what I would answer with that. I think I hear somebody outside there. Um, okay, I'm about to take a break here and I'll be right back.